Joe Kent is pulling ahead in the race for Southwest Washington's seat in Congress. He's a far-right Republican. He got the endorsement of Donald Trump, and he's poised to oust Jamie Herrera Butler from the race. I realized that she was not capable of defending our district and really our nation um, against the onslaught of what the, the radical left is doing to our country right now. But Ken Kent, a political newcomer with what some consider extreme opinions, hold on to the district for Republicans? Or will we see Southwest Washington flip blue? It's really a, such an unusual year and voters are so volatile in the way they're looking at the races. Here's the story. I'm Pat Doris. Welcome to the story. I've been off on vacation for a week and a half and had a wonderful time. I missed you. I saw some of your emails. I'm so glad to be back. And what a night of news we have prepared for you. Spectacular. Let's get going. Our big story is the win by political novice Joe Kent in Washington's 3rd District. He's a Republican unseating six-term incumbent Jamie Herrera Butler and moving on to the general election. Kent is giving a victory speech at 6.30. We'll have a crew there. In the meantime, Herrera Butler put out a brief statement thanking voters for sending her to Congress six times. She said she was accomplished, she has accomplished many things, writing, quote, some were pleasant surprises, like growing my family by three wonderful children, and in doing so, providing an example for other women that you can serve your country in elected office while raising a young family. Herrera Butler was 31 when first elected to Congress. She's also one of only 10 Republicans who voted to impeach former President Trump, who then backed her opponent. She wrote, some were unexpected and difficult. I'm proud that I always told the truth, stuck to my principles, and did what I knew to be best for our country. For the past six election cycles, Jamie Herrera Butler, the Republican, has won the race to represent Southwest Washington's third congressional district. Now think about that. Every two years since 2010, 2012, 2014, 2016, just like clockwork, Herrera Butler has run and been elected. And now that clock has stopped. Herrera Butler conceded her race just after 5 o'clock tonight. She's behind her challenger, Kent, by 928 votes. Kent will face off against Democrat Marie Glusenkamp Perez, and Herrera Butler will be watching from home. To help make sense of all this, we're going to lean on two veteran political watchers. The first is Professor Jim Moore of Pacific University, who was nice enough to put on his signature bow tie today and talk about why Kent's victory throws the race wide open in what has been a safe Republican seat. Yeah, it really does. And it does in interesting ways. Remember, this district was redrawn, as every district in the country was, and by all accounts, it became more Republican, so easier for the Republican to hold on to the seat. Now, clearly, the Republican Party is extremely fractured. I mean, there were nine people in this race, and only two of them, kind of maybe three of them, weren't Republicans. There were four major Republican players. So do the Republicans come together and say, we want to keep the seat? Or do those who supported Jamie Herrera Butler say, we support you, we don't want a Trump person, do they then vote for the Democrat? So that'll definitely be fascinating to watch. Herrera Butler was somewhat of a moderate Republican, so you can see why it's not that much of a stretch to think about her voters maybe considering going for the Democrat instead of the Trump Republican, which, by the way, is not to take anything away from Joe Kent. He clearly has tens of thousands of supporters. And I wonder if his support shows that the 3rd District is more conservative than it appeared. It's not clear because there were, there were at least two pro-Trump candidates in here. And when you put their votes together, you get about 38% of the total vote in the primary. So does that mean that the whole district is going Trump? I don't think so at this point. There's another real important difference between the primary and the general election. The general election is going to have about twice as many people actually turn out to vote. So it's going to be a more accurate representation of the district as a whole as compared to those who felt really motivated to turn out in the primary election. As the next phase of the race gets underway, we will likely see big money start to pour into this race. The Democrats have a slight edge in the U.S. House and Republicans seem ready to narrow that gap in November, maybe even take control. So if Democrats can swipe this one time safe Republican seat, they'd love it. In the meantime, our political expert Len Bergstein says the candidates need to get to work. 
these congressional district races most often are determined by who makes the best pitch to people about who can represent them best, who cares the most about their issues. And I don't think that either Joe, Kent, or Perez at this point is a, is a very developed personality uh, on that issue uh, to their voters. A translation would be, you're going to see a lot of ads as soon as the dust settles, which is about now. Washington's primary is sort of late in the campaign season, so there's only about three months left until the general election. It's going to be kind of a sprint to the finish line. And Len agrees with Professor Moore that the one-time safe Republican seat is safe no more. But it sets up a very interesting uh, uh, campaign where this third congressional district, which has been a stronghold for the Republicans for these six terms, uh, and Jamie Herrera Butler has held off challenges very effectively. It might not be quite so easy for the Republicans to hold on to this particular race with an unknown and untested person like Joe Kent. It's going to be fascinating. Let us know what you think about this one if you live in the third district. Is Kent your candidate or Perez and why? I'm sure we're going to be covering this a lot, so I look forward to hearing from you and reading your feedback. Now let's follow up on a story we brought you yesterday. That's when we introduce you to Emily Green, a reporter with The Lund Report, who just published a series on new meth and how it's making Oregon's mental health and homeless crisis worse. We want to show you a bit more of that interview. And before we dive into it, a reminder that you can read the entire series right now on thelundreport.org. Maybe wait till the newscast is over, but you know what I mean. Now, let's get to a viewer question. I know a lot of you have. Vicki wants to know, what is happening with the money from Measure 110? Well, Vicki, it's your lucky day. Emily Green is pretty knowledgeable when it comes to Measure 110. Here's a little peek behind the curtain. I actually have a copy of the measure's uh, preamble hanging in my office to kind of remind me what uh, voters were promised when it was passed. Um, and it's called the Drug Addiction Treatment and Recovery Act. And the very first line of the preamble says, whereas Oregonians need adequate access to drug addiction treatment. Kind of looked like she was looking at her wall to read that, huh? She definitely knows her stuff. Let's get back to the facts because you're going to find this next part fascinating. Emily talked to Tara Hurst, the executive director at the Oregon Health Justice Recovery Alliance. I asked their director, um, Tara Hurst, you know, what do you think about the state's failure to address the um, meth crisis in a meaningful way? And um, I was a little surprised by her um, Initial response to me, she said, our interest as a coalition is not necessarily to reduce substance use disorder in Oregon. Um, and instead, you know, we want to focus on stopping the ongoing harms of the war on drugs, ending fatal overdoses, reducing stigma, um, expanding harm reduction. And, you know, while all of these um, are really important pieces of fixing Oregon's addiction treatment system, um, there does need to be a focus um, from somewhere <laughs> on, you know, creating that infrastructure that's needed to really help um, some of these really high cost, high impact growing populations of folks that are struggling with both mental illness and substance use disorder. Green also reached out to Oregon Health Authority and Governor Brown's office to ask what they're doing to fix the meth epidemic. They both pointed to fixing the system, quote, holistically, but didn't really have an answer about addiction treatment. So there's a lot of resources right now that could be wielded in a way that could harness some um, promising interventions that we know about. Uh, there was over a billion dollars from the last couple of legislative sessions, over 300 million every two years. That's ongoing funding through ballot measure 110. But what we're finding is that it's all being spent in a rather disjointed approach. And I think um, the state's failure to really harness some of the solutions around meth is just, you know, it's kind of an example and just illustrates how there really is no plan, no one's really mapped out um, to ensure that all of this spending is actually going to address Oregon's most pressing needs. 
hopefully with Emily's reporting that can change. Thanks again to Emily Green talking about uh, her reporting with us. We'll have one more segment on her series tomorrow. And remember, you can find her series at thelundreport.org. Let's talk now about our homeless crisis. This morning, I went for a swim in the Columbia River, and on my way home, I turned from Marine Drive onto Northeast 33rd. Now, that's a notorious place for homeless campers in Northeast Portland. The sides of the road are full of RVs and campers and piles and piles and more piles of garbage. But I also spotted something new today, a crew from the city of Portland beginning a cleanup effort there and installing large, heavy concrete blocks to discourage camping. Blair Best reports. A different kind of alarm. The sound of time running out. But a little bit of notice could have been, could have been helpful. Al lives in one of the trailers parked along 33rd Drive in Northeast Portland, just west of the airport. It's a hot spot for homeless campers. It's 33rd Avenue, man. 33rd and Marine Drive. Everything goes on down here. That's why I leave during the day. I go to work, I come home, I go to sleep. He was home on his lunch break when City of Portland crews started pushing trash onto the front of his camper. These guys are sitting here just throwing trash from all the way down there and just bringing it all the way up to my trailer like it's mine. He says they told him he has one day to move or else they'll tow his trailer away. And then they just spring on me this morning that I gotta move my trailer and I have no way of doing that. He's just the latest among those who have been forced out this week. Uh, yesterday was the day that they forced us to move here. Devin was living in a trailer across the street. Uh, right up here, actually. He says this is the second time the Portland Bureau of Transportation has moved him and his friends in just the past six months. They told us that there was about, I'd say, five trailers that needed to be moved, and they only gave us like four days notice. Not very much notice at all, especially when we don't have a truck. We had to find someone to come move our trailer for us. It was a grueling process that lasted them 24 hours. And that's my home. You were going to take my home. I was not going to have anywhere to stay after that. The city tells KGW that Peabot is making room for a new Safe Rest Village site that will open nearby. So they're moving some of their maintenance operations to a lot off Northeast 33rd Drive, which is blocked by these homeless camps. They told campers to move last week and again yesterday. Peabot Parking Enforcement and police removed the camps blocking the entrance to Peabot's new property. Many who live on this strip say they're tired of being moved from one place to another, even if it's just across the street. They say they want more than anything to get out of this cycle. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good. It's due to the fact that I don't have resources that I am forced to be out here. Lack of available resources is one reason, but many have another Probably struggle in common. Drug use, honestly. Um, and that's due to my own issues. It's largely due to my drug use. You can't get a break, you know. I mean, we're not having fun over here. I mean, at least I'm not. But people assume that, you know, we're having a blast over here camping, you know. It's like a hamster wheel. Once you get out here, it's hard to get out. In Northeast Portland, Blair Best, KGW News. Two years after one of the worst fire seasons we've ever seen, a small sign of recovery and hope. The Willamette National Forest starting to open up to visitors again. But you'll need to be careful if you're going out. Some areas are still dangerous. We'll have a look when the story returns.
Welcome back. Keep sending your questions and comments to the story at KGW.com. That's our email address. Or you could give us a call and leave a voicemail. 503-226-5090. Hey, there's some good news for you outdoorsy types this summer. Parts of the Willamette National Forest have reopened. Areas that were hit hard by wildfires in the 2020 season are coming back to life. Some spots, though, are still pretty hazardous. And the U.S. Forest Service says if you are headed out to explore, you need to be careful. Here's Tim Gordon. The Willamette National Forest covers a lot of the Cascades from south of Eugene up north to the Detroit Ranger District. Of course, the Beachy Creek Fire did a lot of damage throughout the San Diem Canyon in Detroit and on the Willamette National Forest. It was uh, definitely, uh, as it's been coined, a once in a century event. So it was uh, quite a, an experience that I'll definitely keep with me the rest of my life. Forest Supervisor Dwayne Bishop was there for the fires and has been directing the recovery. And after two years of rebuilding and regrowth, the woods are making a comeback. So the U.S. Forest Service is opening more than 188,000 acres in the Willamette National Forest that was closed. Plenty of forest was untouched. Other land was not severely burned, but other sections were hit hard. You know, visitors will see, uh, you know, a lot of fire killed trees and, and vegetation. Um, and so they'll it'll be uh, it'll be very much dependent on where they want to go uh, on the forest and what they might see or experience. Bishop says, especially around roads and trails, it's a work in progress that will take years to complete. It's, it's called uh, the four steps for safety. Look up, look down, look around and look below. So if you get out there, be careful and know what you're getting into. We're asking people to come out and visit public land that to really take in an accounting based on your skill level about where you want to be and some of the hazards around you and just be, uh, be uh, cognizant of that and really pay attention to your surroundings. But we also are very excited to open these areas up and for people to come out and visit, enjoy and, and to continue to make memories. Tim Gordon, KGW News. Looks like a beautiful place. Still ahead, your memories of the historic Roseway Theater before it was damaged in a fire this past weekend. I spent a lot of summers at the Roseway Theater with my grandchildren. We bought tickets for summer viewing and we went about every week. What a nice memory. The theater held a special place for a lot of people, especially in Northeast Portland. We're gonna hear more when we come back.
One of our favorite things to do on this show is look back at Oregon and Washington history. Many of you have been here for a long time and we love when you share your memories. Keep them coming and let us know what other history you want us to look into. We asked recently for your memories of the historic Roseway Theater in Northeast Portland. The theater was heavily damaged in a fire this past weekend. Right now there's no word on how bad the damage is or whether they'll be able to rebuild, but it doesn't look that great. It's been in the community for nearly 100 years. We definitely hope that it can come back. And it's a special place to a lot of you, like Kathy, who left us this voicemail. I spent a lot of summers at the Roseway Theater with my grandchildren. We bought tickets for summer viewing, and we went about every week. It was a really wonderful thing. We had lots of fun, and it was a great theater. I'm really, really sorry that this happened. It was a great addition to the neighborhood. Another message from Barb, who grew up in the neighborhood, says that in the late 50s and early 60s, parents in the neighborhood would buy scripts for their kids to see movies every Wednesday in the summer. We all walked up to the theater together for a 1 p.m. movie. Kids were lined up around the block to get in, and we watched the Three Stooges, Tarzan, and Francis the Mule movies. We each got a quarter to buy candy from the lobby glass case, so we filled up on milk duds, good and plenty, spearmint leaves, junior mints, orange slices, sugar babies, and more. Later as teenagers and students at Madison, the Roseway was a popular destination for Friday and Saturday night date nights. Barb, we love reading about that. A few of you also sent us pictures of the Roseway featured in history books. Chuck sent us this one from the book Theaters of Portland by Gary Lotcher and Steve Stone. It describes how the theater opened in 1924 and started showing classic revival films in the 70s. They even added a pipe organ during that time. It was later remodeled in 2008. Chuck, thanks for sending that in. We appreciate it. And Bonnie sent us pictures from the book 65 Years Lives Lives and Legends by George A. Denfield. It talks about the first operators of the theater and some of the entertainment that they used to put on. Bonnie also told us, I lived in the Roseway neighborhood from 1947 until 2014. So I spent many an hour in the old theater. Thanks for sharing all of that with us, Bonnie. If you have memories of the Roseway Theater or anything else interesting in this local area, we'd love to hear from you as well. A new mural across the street from T-Mobile Park in Seattle sheds light on local baseball history that's often overlooked, Seattle's Negro League baseball team. Natalie Swaby from our sister station at King 5 has a look at the project. Across the street from the Mariners' ballpark. He's using a heat gun so that this vinyl wrap adheres to the brick. They're putting the finishing touches on Steelhead's Alley and paying tribute at the same time. Just try to tell the whole story in one mural. Damon Brown is the artist who set out to share the undertold stories of baseball, a diverse history that includes the Seattle Steelheads, a professional all-black team that played in 1946. We have uh, Negro League players that have teams that were here in Seattle, various teams uh, from different cultures, Japanese teams. When they open the doors here later this month, the mural will be on display. Damon Brown says it's a work of art a baseball historian helped make happen. Dave is the guy with all the information. Dave Eskenazi. Every community uh, had a baseball team. His research helped this mural honor the local teams that did not make headlines in the past. You read about the professional teams, the major league team, the minor league teams, the Pacific Coast League in the region, but you didn't read so much about the, the Mikado club in the Japanese community that played uh, other teams in the, in the region. Now those teams will be recognized right here. And for this artist, it means so much. Pride, pride for my state. I'm like, wow, I didn't know we were, had a, a piece of history like that. I didn't know so much history was here. And we have so much baseball history here. It's important, I mean, so long these stories haven't been told. So long we haven't had a seat at the table. But now this mural will be front and center to tell a powerful story. But I think to just be able to be part of telling history and preserving history is a whole different feeling. How nice. Hey, keep sending your questions and comments to the story at KGW.com. When we come back, how you can help school kids in your area.
Our Hey Help campaign for the next couple of weeks is the KGW School Supply Drive. We're trying to raise enough money and supplies for more than 15,000 kids. And one of the best and easiest ways you can help is just to give online. You can do that right now, in fact, if you grab your phone, aim your camera at the QR code there on your screen, and then donate on the website. There's also a list of collection partners in your area where you can give in person. And if your phone is not handy right now, just remember kgw.com slash school. One thing likely to be on your kid's school supply list, that classic pencil, the number two. But have you ever used a number one or maybe even a number four pencil? I don't think I have. They do actually exist, at least in theory. But if you haven't come across one, well, there's a reason for that. Devin Haskins grinds up the graphite for what's in a name. Every pencil will leave a mark. They can craft a story or make a work of art famous. Or do something as simple as write your name so the teacher knows who it's from. And hence it's a way of recording uh, thoughts, ideas, history, uh, inventions. It's a way of thinking with your hands as well as your mind. That's Henry Petrosky, retired distinguished professor of civil engineering at Duke University. He wrote a book called The Pencil, A History of Design and Circumstance. The first pencils were made hundreds of years ago after graphite, it's what we write with in the pencils, was found in England. The carbon proved to be an effective utensil, although a messy one. Well, when you did that, of course, your hands got very dirty. So to fix the mess, it was wrapped in string and later evolved to a wood casing, like the kind we use today. It's estimated more than 15 billion pencils are produced each year, and there's usually only one you'll find on your kid's school supply list. You could call it the Goldilocks choice of pencils. Number two was the one that was a happy medium between being too hard and being too soft. When American poet and philosopher Henry David Thoreau was working at his family's pencil factory in his younger years, he created a hardness scale that rated each pencil's graphite makeup. That number two rating is based on that scale for hardness. There's one, two, three, or four. The lower the number, the lighter the black. The higher the number, the darker. In America, we, we pretty much buy pencils according to this number. Making the number two pencil the number one choice for teachers. It doesn't have to be pressed too hard to make a readable line. Uh, and it's not so fine a line, usually. And that's what's in a name. <laughs> Always learn so much from those. Thanks, Devin. Hey, that's the end of our program. Thanks so much for watching. But remember the story, our story?